So in the next couple weeks, we're going to be getting a lot more data from companies announcing earnings about the global economy and also about the U.S. consumer. And the data that is coming out is not good. But that doesn't seem to worry the stock market too much as the stock market is not crashing. Then again, we don't exactly have the stock market trading on fundamentals anymore, do we, for the most part? Although for individual companies, this may be the case because if a company totally bombs, their guidance for revenues or earnings totally misses, then the stock will get hammered. But the overall stock market indices are still the, the Dow today is up over 24 it's over 24,000 at 24,579 so despite the bad news and we did have a lot of bad news in the last couple of days apple in fact their china sales plunged 27% guidance is lower this would be why over the last couple of months apple was no, no longer going to announce iphone sales so apple will still have strong revenue how they will make up the lack of sales will be raising the price so if you're loyal to the Apple brand, you're going to have to pay more. But we are having a lot of bad economic data, like I said. It, there is, whether it's the, okay, I just saw this, conference board confidence report, the ratio of president, excuse me, present situation to, quote, expectations from conference board confidence report. The chart is in the Wall Street for Main Street Facebook group. You can take a look at it, and it tends to peak. So it might be a leading economic indicator about the stock market and the global economy. And it's saying that cut and dry sign of a tapped out consumer, a great leading indicator at turning points because it either coincides with the recession or occurs a few months prior. And that is not my analysis. I am repeating from David Rosenberg, who I think is one of the most rational level headed Keynesians out there. He's a private sector Keynesian. He's not one of these government eggheads working at the Bureau of Labor Statistics or, you know, one of those government economist that's making six figures. So I think there is also a lot of evidence that credit is starting to freeze up. Uh, Caterpillar yesterday announced, missed very badly on earnings. I have a link here to the Seeking Alpha article if you wanna go into depth more about it. I believe, let me just take a look really quick. So Caterpillar only delivered an EPS of $2.55 adjusted and analysts were expecting $2.98, and they were warning people that part of the reason why it wasn't so good, I think revenues were slightly below expectations, is China. So you could check out the C what the CEO and the other people at Caterpillar said about China. Uh, the quote, I think, is, let's see here. Within China, the industry is very dynamic. Sounds like bullshit there. And there are a variety of forecasts. We'll continue to monitor this situation, which does not sound good. I'm inserting that. But as of now, we are forecasting the overall China market to be roughly flat in 2019, following two years of significant growth. China represents about 10% to 15% of our total construction industry sales and about 5% to 10% of total Caterpillar sales and revenues. And it says, this is other analysis from an article on Seeking Alpha. I'm reading not the quote from the Caterpillar Q4 2018 conference call. What worries me particularly is Caterpillar's guidance on China. The idea that the Chinese market is cooling off was expected by people, but I think that the reality of the situation is worse than the expectation. So there's a lot more. I'll attach a link if you want to go in depth on this article. But we've had bad news about China from both Apple. There was continued bad news about Apple sales in China uh, today and also Caterpillar yesterday. And the U.S. consumer data, which came out in the aforementioned report there from the Conference Board Confidence Report, is another bad sign. Jeff Gonlock was on Twitter talking about this, as well as David Rosenberg. And something else that caught my eye today is GameStop. So GameStop was the bricks and mortars company that was making a lot of money 10 years ago selling you know, video games. You could trade your video game systems in there or after you played a video game, you could trade it in for credit and go get a new video game or you could rent a video game. And so a lot of these video games are digital now or it's online multiplayer. You don't even have to go to GameStop anymore. The local GameStop to me went out of business. But GameStop, for those of you who are not familiar, is on the New York Stock Exchange, symbol GME. The stock uh, dropped 26% today after its 
at one point during the day after its board of directors voted to end efforts to sell the company and this quotes these quotes are very interesting to me and why i'm talking about it and doing the live stream quote gamestop's board has now terminated efforts to pursue a sale of the company due to the lack of available financing on terms that would be commercially acceptable to a prospective acquirer end quote the company said in a press release and so GameStop only has, I'm looking at their financials on Yahoo Finance, they only have about a $1.15 billion market cap, which is not enormous, especially to be listed on a, the New York Stock Exchange. And their debt, if you're going to buy a company, like a publicly traded company, you have to do the enterprise value. So that's, that's the market cap, the stock value, plus the debt, and you back out the cash. And that's how you calculate enterprise value or EV. And so the debt, let me take a look here real quick at the debt. Let's see here, balance sheet, annual debt. Okay, here we go. Okay, long-term debt, they have over $800 million in long-term debt, but they have a lot more in current liabilities. So this is, this is not a massive leverage buyout. Now, we could argue whether or not GameStop actually has some decent assets, but I think it's very interesting how in an environment in the past where easily billions of dollars could be raised for leverage buyouts that now for only a billion or $2 billion, it's probably a little over $2 billion for a leverage buyout to occur. So the interest rate you're borrowing at, plus you have to buy all the debt and the equity to do a leverage buyout. And it seems that the credit's not available for that. So I think this is very telling. Now, GameStop is at $11.28 a share. This this might mean, so this is not financial advice, just my opinion. This might mean that GameStop's going to go bankrupt in the near future. Not in six months, probably not in six months. But normally these things take a little bit longer to play out than you expect. We could see in probably less than two or three years, we could see GameStop, GameStop go totally bust. But it is very, very weird in an environment where that type of debt is normally pretty easily available. Remember how I talked about Cedral on a live show a couple weeks ago? And I was telling you guys that Cedral went through bankruptcy. They were owned by one of the richest billionaires in Europe. And the bankers and creditors discharged Cedral with a really, really bad balance sheet. Well, Cedral has, I was reading new articles on Seeking Alpha, Cedral has immense problems now too. Because the master limited partnership that Cedral owns some some ownership in, that's experiencing problems. So Cedral was a mess after it was discharged from bankruptcy. This this the blame for Cedral after it's discharged from bankruptcy goes to the foot of the bankers and the creditors who did not put the company on sound footing. Okay, they had a fifty to one debt to EBITDA ratio after bankruptcy. You're not being fair. To the company after bankruptcy to give them a shot to survive on their own after that okay this was ridiculous this is basically setting the company up for failure so we could see we could see cedral cedral's in some trouble here if the oil prices don't rise in the near future but i just wanted to do a short little live stream today because there i think there's a new episode of the flash going on at 8 p.m you guys know i like science fiction and superhero stuff so I wanted to talk about the GameStop stuff, uh, the the comments about that, about how the credit is freezing up. Not only it looks like the consumer, U.S. consumer, is starting to be tapped out on the data we're seeing, but also looks like the leverage buyout market is starting to freeze up. Because in the past, even in the, you know, a couple months ago, I think the leverage buyout market maybe started, especially the junk bond debt market, started to really freeze up about three or four months ago. There was like some no bids. Because the investment banks couldn't sell tranches of junk bonds for a while. There was like a month span where the investment banks couldn't offload it. So that was a big red flag. So we're starting to see the leverage buyout market. And the, for those of you not familiar, you normally need access to high yield debt. Private equity borrows at a very high interest rate, but it's carried interest. I don't want to explain all that stuff. There's been people for years predict predicting that the, in the investment community, predicting that the carried interest will go away, and it hasn't. We'll see, but a lot of those guys are, con the private equity guys and hedge fund guys have lobbyists, and they, they have, you know, big lobbying dollars go to both main political parties, so I don't know if I really see that going away. Even, even during 2008, they still didn't take it away and with the Occupy movement and all that. Okay. 
So I got an email from a longtime loyal listener, and this was today. A guy named Mark. I won't mention any more of his name. But he said, I'm not an Austrian school economist based on how I complain, how I do a free podcast and I complain about money all the time. Well, Mark, you weren't aware of this. We spoke in a number of emails today. But Ludwig von Mises, I encourage you for my listeners to go read the biography that Guido Jörg Holzman wrote about Ludwig von Mises. It's available on audiobook. You can buy the biography, the digital one. I'm on the Mises.org st- a bookstore. You can buy the digital version of the book for $5 if you want to learn about L- Ludwig von Mises or the actual book for $25. It's also available on audiobook on Audible. And you find out that Mises contributed an enormous amount to the field of economics, especially free market and Austrian school besides just Karl Menger and, and the people before him. Menger was von Mises' teacher. And von Mises wrote, you know, The Theory of Money and Credit, the book on socialism, which is so great, and then obviously his magnum opus, Human Action. And if you read the biography of von Mises, and it's about a 30-something hour audiobook approximately, and I learned a lot about there, you learn that von Mises, despite creating all this value for society, he basically was very similar to how like Vincent van Gogh and a lot of the other great artists were, how their work was not appreciated while they were alive and they really couldn't earn a living. So von Mises, when he came to the United States and you know he escaped Nazi Austria, Nazi occupied Austria was crazy. He basically came here almost penniless. Uh, he did not get a full-time teaching job. He got like a part-time teaching job, I think, at New York University. It was a small little stipend. And he almost died broke and penniless, but he was still a happy man because he got to teach his his content and put it out there. But he never really made a good living or ma- any wealth whatsoever off of giving society this great knowledge and insights. It's really sad. So if you read the biography about him, when he came to New York in the United States, he could not get a full-time teaching job. He was totally blacklisted by everyone. And if not for like the generous contributions of a few rich donors, he probably would not have been able to pay his bills because he only for a couple years, I think, had like a part-time teaching job at New York University as a visiting professor, which did not was not a well-paying gig. And there was a couple rich donors that gave him enough money to pay his bills. And him and his wife, Margit, they were only able to afford a very modest, small apartment in New York City. So they were not living very comfortably. So he's saying that I'm not an Austrian school economist for talking about money or stuff like for bringing up money and things like that. Well, you know what, man? There's been a lot of great Austrian school economists. My point is that you have people like Ludwig von Mises who put the work out there, put the who did amazing research, wrote great books, and it was not appreciated by society at the time. In fact, he was intentionally like blacklisted because all the people in power were Keynesians. So he was criticizing the government. He was criticizing big government. He was criticizing socialism, criticizing fascism, criticizing totalitarian government. And they basically made it impossible for him to earn a living. I mean, he earned bar- he barely got by. Hello, Kirsten. Um, you know, Tesla, the thing is, those the, the, the accounting is fraudulent. So at some point, the numbers will be worse. Uh, if you follow the stuff on Twitter, the Tesla Q, the pictures of the lots with all the cars, this is going to end in tears at some point. I don't want to give it a time frame, but prior to the earnings announcement this week, a lot of the people who are short Tesla bought uh, calls. So a lot of the Tesla shorts bought calls as hedges, as insurance. So Mark, to say that I'm not an Austrian school economist and I don't know anything about Austrian school economics because I'm asking for any money is, is really a stupid and lazy argument because I've, I think my work is up there with the best people in the industry, frankly. I know, I know more than most of the investment analysts and hedge fund managers out there. Okay, a lot of these guys don't even don't even read full books anymore. So I would encourage you to read the biography of Ludwig von Mises. The man struggled. He made a he had a good salary in Austria, even though the government tried to kill him. They sent him to the front lines in World War One. 
So he had like a good teaching position. And then as the government started to hyperinflate the currency and the government went to more central planning, they went out of their way to ruin his life economically. And he barely survived, you know, getting out of the country and coming to the United States. And then once he got to the United States, he struggled financially for the rest of his life. He was basically a starving artist, which is what the best uh, content creators on YouTube now are. Well, a lot of them, especially in my space. They're starving artists. Unless they're willing to sell their soul to do pump and dump. And not disclose it publicly. Okay, so a couple more things before I let you guys go. So I got some... I've been speaking with emails with this really good mining stock investor guy who's a long-term listener to the podcast. I think, I think his name's Simon from New Zealand. So shout out to Simon. Simon forwarded me some emails from the investor relations of a junior mining company. And there was just basically blatant lies in there. I was discussing with this uh, about, I don't remember the company's name, but this is unfortunately all too common. And I know a lot of you guys like in the live stream section ask me about mining stock stuff and I get emails all the time about specific mining stocks. But you know, from here on out, I just don't think I should comment on it publicly. I will talk about the industry in general, and occasionally I will do videos talking about how the industry is changing, how the industry is adapting, how the industry is probably screwing up, unfortunately. But in general, so many of these mining companies, and there are rare exceptions, most of these, whether it's a producing miner or a junior explorer or a junior miner, most of these companies themselves, from an operational standpoint or from the way the capital structure is, are dumpster fires, okay? The overwhelming majority of the mining industry over the long term totally destroys capital so the odds are that if you are a long-term investor in this sector you will lose money okay the industry is designed unfortunately the way it is right now the industry is designed to lose capital and for management to filter things to themselves to keep their jobs now some of these management teams are being replaced but Unfortunately, we're seeing I'm seeing so many examples still of management teams desperate to to stay alive, to lie to shareholders, not tell the truth or partial truths. Because obviously some of these things are being vetted by their lawyers and and regulators and stuff like that. But, you know, I got forwarded an email from a junior mining investor relations from my friend Simon, who I speak to in emails and there was just blatant lies in the email. I was shocked at some of the claims that were being made. One of the claims being made was that a producing mine from a large primary silver producer was running out of reserves and that they were going to invest capital, a lot of capital, into this new junior. And if you, all of this stuff was easily verifiable as a lie. Because if you went to the website for the primary silver miner, you could easily tell that the mine had at least seven to eight years left of proven reserves and it said that they were having exploration success drilling too so buyer beware man like i've said now for a while now unfortunately and i've gotten to know a lot of people in the gold and silver industry there are not a lot of honest people in the gold and silver industry whether that's a lot of bullion dealers whether that's a lot of mining companies whether that's a lot of people doing podcasts and Unfortunately, this is how it is. And people are fighting, kicking and screaming, lying over a declining economic pie in the gold and silver industry. Okay, people people have spent a lot of time trying to make content or sell bullion or keep the lights on at their junior miner or whatever. And there, some of them, not all of them, because there are some good people, but some of them are willing to do or say anything to survive or make money. Hello, Kirsten. Sandstorm is not a miner, and Sandstorm has a really good business model, and they are diversified, and they are focusing on diversifying their cash flows. So maybe they get bought out. This is just my opinion. Maybe they get bought out in the next couple years because one of the larger companies wants growth, but they have really good assets, and unlike the other companies, they actually have free cash flow, and they think their stock is cheap, and they're buying back their stock, and they're also focusing on growth. 
So I think it's a pretty well-run company. They made mistakes earlier, years ago, and I think they've learned from them. And unfortunately, I think a lot of these other producing mining companies are not learning from their mistakes. What a lot of these mining companies are doing is they're transitioning the ones who mine silver. They're transit. They bought really mediocre or shitty gold mines, and to buy time so they can raise more capital in the next couple years. As soon as there's a big rally in gold and silver prices, a lot of these miners are gonna dilute like hell. It's gonna be really bad share dilution. But they've bought. They've already diluted a lot of them to go and buy a gold mine because the economics for mining silver are so bad. Now, if we have Steve San Angelo just put out an article about this, if we have, and I've been talking about this for years, long before Steve San Angelo talked about this, I got in a big fight, if you guys remember, go back in 2012, if you want to uh, hear about this, and I got in a big fight with Mickey Fulp on a podcast, the mercenary geologist about the copper market. And I've gotten in some arguments with Rick Roll about this. I was predicting copper was going to crash for a long time. Because on the demand side, it was all Chinese central planning. And China, there's big, big problems in China. So if there's any more right, like junior mining stock questions or producing miners, I will just try to avoid those in the live stream section or in emails for now. But I would warn you guys to be very careful about most of those stocks. Now, if the gold and silver price goes crazy, everything will go up. It's like what Doug Casey says, how if the wind is strong enough, even turkeys can fly. But for a lot of these companies, as soon as the gold price goes to like 1350 1400 as soon as silver goes to 18 or 20 or 21 a lot of these companies are just going to sell crazy amounts of shares to fix their balance sheets. Which may be good for management team and may be good temporarily for the company, but a lot of these companies have a very bad track record of squandering capital. So capital raises once in a while, depending upon how the capital is used, is okay. But a lot of these companies have a very, very poor track record of what they do with the capital after they raise it. Okay, I think I got pretty much everything in my... Oh, one last thing. So, okay, I'm pulling up the chart. Okay, so 10 years ago, the VXX, Victor Xavier Xavier, was introduced. Tomorrow, the VXX dies. Every long died along the way. That's someone else's tweet. And I just put, this is why most retail traders cannot win. Most don't even read the prospectus. The VXX was the IPATH XP 500 VIX short-term futures exchange traded note on the New York Stock Exchange. And the long-term chart is insane. This NorthmanTrader.com, Sven is the guy on Twitter who put out the chart. The long tenure chart of this exchange traded note is insane. It's collapsed 99%. <laughs> Meanwhile, you know, the people who designed this, the the lawyers, the investment bankers, the the company that that uh, issued the exchange traded note, they've made tons of money. <laughs> but the people trading this stuff probably made nothing, probably lost a ton. What a crazy world we live in, right? We're a product that's supposed to do one thing. You don't read the prospectus. You think, you, you think you're think uh, you setting yourself up for a winning trade, and then it drops 99%. <laughs> oh, my God. Hello, Kirsten. Uh, could have been a temporary short squeeze in Apple. You're talking about Apple earnings were very iffy. Shares increased 8 to 9%. Could be just a temporary short squeeze. I expect a lot more volatility in Apple share prices. So this is not financial advice, just my opinion, stupid disclaimer. One of those ways maybe to set up like a long straddle with puts and calls on volatility. Apple has a leveraged balance sheet now. They have been using a lot of financialization and debt. You have people like Carl Icahn and others saying to buy back shares and issue debt and Apple is not doing a ton of innovating. Apple's business model now, they they are in the research and development working on some new products. They just haven't released anything crazy yet. 
but the smartphone market is saturated. Their business model right now is basically just increased prices because they're losing, they're getting their butts kicked in China. They're not going to have any sales growth in China unless they increase prices. They're not going to sell any more units of iPhones in China though. So Apple's business model basically is to take advantage of people who are loyal to the brand and jack up the prices. That's how they're going to appease Wall Street. And you know what? At a certain point, if they keep increasing prices 10, 15, 20%, those marginal buyers who liked having app, new Apple products are going to say, you know what? I can't afford this. I can't afford a $2,000 iPhone. I can't afford a $2,000 iPhone with all the bells and whistles. I'm going to go buy a Samsung that's 20% less or something or another competitor that enters the market. So there will always be people loyal to Apple, but at the margin, if they keep raising prices, eventually that marginal consumer Apple products is going to be decreasing by a lot. And that's what was driving Apple's growth for many years is they're bringing on more and more new customers. They're growing sales all over the planet. That, to me, Kirsten, looks like that's going in reverse. So Apple can still maintain healthy revenue growth, but they have to raise prices. And at some point, that's going to bust the consumer, especially if the consumer here in the United States and Europe does not have the, the discretionary income. Like I've tried to stress now for a while, whether it's in so many different states here in the U.S. or elsewhere or in France, you have people who are, and there's tons of other examples, people are just getting killed with tax increases. Taxes are being layered on like crazy. Whenever I go out to eat on the weekends now, there's basically a 10% restaurant tax that's added. The average person is going to ultimately say, you know what, I'm not going to be able to afford all of these tax increases and have to cut back. Or if it's in a specific city and state and your property tax gets jacked up, you're going to move or sell your house and rent. Okay, well, I'm looking at listener questions and comments. Luminary Wind says GameStop, uh, excuse me, GameStop will go bankrupt. It's looking that way. It's a question of when and not if as of now. The video game market is still very big, but it looks like that a lot of people now, video games are mostly just software instead of just hardware. Or if you have a hardware unit, you can buy the new game. You can buy it online and just download it because a lot of those gaming systems, which are the hardware component, are connected to the internet or from your computer. You can just download a new game from the internet. So it's kind of like GameStop is getting blockbuster, basically blockbuster videoed. And, you know, guys, funny thing, Blockbuster had the chance to buy Netflix. The Netflix CEO went in there and the Blockbuster people laughed him out of the building. The story, go read that story if you have a, like an extra five or ten minutes. It's a pretty incredible story. It's like the Dyson vacuum guy going to the, the other vacuum companies. And now if you look at the vacuums that all the old vacuum companies like Hoover and Bissell and those guys, it's all di almost direct copycats of Dyson's innovation. Okay, I'm still looking at listener questions and comments. Hello, Kirsten. Sand Sandstorm is still looking very good. They're buying back their share. They're going to be buying back their shares after they have more cash on the balance sheet. They just did, I think, a really good deal. They got a really good royalty on one of the highest grade and lowest cost new gold mines going into production right now on the, on planet earth. And so that it's only going to add it's not a it's not a company maker cuz it's a small royalty, but it's going to really help out their diversification and that mine, the Fruta del Norte mine in Ecuador has so much exploration upside. The royalty is on a very large land package that that royalty could be throwing off 3 million to 5 million dollars in cash flow for many many years way longer than the current mine plan. And if you're going to build a royalty and streaming company, the best things to do is you have a portfolio of royalty similar to what Sandstorm just bought. So Sandstorm's, Sandstorm's doing, in my opinion now, they've learned from their past mistakes, which is always good. You want to see that out of a management team that they learn from their mistakes and that they are focusing on diversification and they're doing very smart deals and they're building the company the right way. And what would be a warning sign to me is if they got too greedy and like tried to use too much of their revolving credit facility on a deal that was too risky. So take on too much debt for too risky of a deal. 
I don't think we're going to see that given the, the um, history. The CEO, Nolan Watson, has his family with debt. Uh, you should listen. He has There's podcasts where he was int- uh, interviewed on Entrepreneur Podcast years ago talking about how his father had badish, really bad problems with debt and he bankrupted his family. So um, I think he's going to be very, very careful with debt. But otherwise, the company has really good sound long-term footing. The last two deals are not too big that Sandstorm has done with the Hyundai royalty and the Fruta del Norte royalty. And I think those are both very solid sound deals. And if they keep doing what they're doing, the baseball analogy is like hitting singles and doubles. So not if you swing too, the baseball analogy is if you swing too hard for the fence, if you take the biggest swing you can up at the plate, even with two strikes, or even if you know the pitcher has better stuff and will overmatch you, you will strike out. You will miss the ball. But if you focus on contact and you hit solid singles and doubles, or you put the ball in play, you choke up with two strikes, and you just hit singles and doubles and focus on contact. And I think that's what Sandstorm Gold has been doing with their last couple deals. I think they're very, very solid, and they're just focusing on you know living within their means and doing solid deals that will diversify the company's cash flows. And over the long term, that's what you want. You don't want the company to take too many like strikeout, home run, big cut swings like the Casey at the bat where they've, they're they swinging so hard that they fall down. Okay, guys. Well, I think that's it for today's live stream show. Just wanted to do a quick one about Caterpillar, GameStop, Apple, uh, the Ludwig von Mises biography saying that I'm not a real Austrian school economist is kind of ridiculous. Saying I'm not a real libertarian, not a real Austrian school economist. I think I put out quality work. You know, the guy, it's just ridiculous. Some, if, if you guys saw some of the hate mail that I get and some of the nasty stuff, the comments under videos, you'd be pissed off too. Oh, another troll. Okay, I blocked him. Okay, guys. Well, that's it for today's live stream show. Thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed this. And uh, I'll attach links to all the articles I talked about in the information section of the video. Bye, guys.